Great, thank you for the invitation, Ravi, and thank you all to attending today. Um, if you've seen any of my events or talks over the summer, you, you will recognize this slide. And I'd like to thank Juliet, who's finally in the audience when I'm showing this, um, for creating this slide. It's adapted from a statement uh, from a blog post by Carrie Diaz Eaton, which is available on the MAA's website. I encourage you to go look up the entire blog post um, for more information. Uh, so I'm just going to read the second paragraph. I will leave the whole slide up for a moment if you all want to read the first one. Um, uh, so this is directed to the broader mathematics community. The first paragraph is specifically to our black mathematicians um, and other mathematicians of color. Uh, but to the broader mathematics community, the, uh, the issues in the above paragraph are a mathematics issue as much as a broader societal issue. Mathematics instruction and research do not happen in a vacuum. We cannot be effective mathematics teachers if we think that students all enter the classroom with the same sense of value and safety. We cannot be effective colleagues if we think that all of our colleagues enter academia with the same sense of value and safety. We need to actively work to become anti-racist as individuals and collectively in our workplaces. In doing so, we must hold ourselves and our academic institutions accountable for the continued oppression of black students, staff, and faculty. And uh, I want to point out that um, Juliet made these slides. Carrie, Carrie's statement was um, earlier in the summer, uh, I think early June at the latest, actually. And uh, when, when I started sharing these at events, I thought, okay, you know, we're, we're going to share these slides and uh, maybe there's going to be some change. There's a lot of energy in the streets. Uh, on one hand, we haven't seen much change and that's disheartening in many ways. On the other hand, I've realized and other people have realized if we see incremental change, that doesn't mean we should stop having these conversations and sharing slides like this. And this is really just, uh, you know, very much a performative act for me to share this. Uh, but if you're interested in, in some other, the, some other um, things that I've been involved with or, or things you can get involved with, please feel free to email me um, or contact me in any other way after the talk. So thank you for allowing me to, to start with this slide. I think it's very important. I'm going to stop my share and switch over to the talk slide if you give me one moment. So um, can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you about something that I've just kind of started working on semi-recently. This, um, this isn't related to my thesis or anything, and my advisor's in the audience, maybe he'll, he'll uh, be disgruntled about me not, not uh, advertising my, my important work, but I, I think this stuff is really cool, and I thought it'd be fun to talk about in a seminar like this. Um, so basically the idea I have for this talk, and, and I, I've given a version of it before, but it's somewhat more progressed, um, is there's a whole zoo of zeta functions out there. I'm going to talk about three types, but there's really a lot of zeta functions out in math. Um, and I want to try to introduce you to the, zoo, the zookeeper for all of these by the end of the talk. So, uh, who, or rather who I think the zookeeper is. She's a bit mysterious still to us, uh, but I, I hope to at least give you a, uh, an introduction and, and hopefully motivate you to study this more or at least pay attention when, um, when papers come out with the words decomposition space or to Siegel space. So um, this is very, very preliminary joint work with Julie Bergner and Matt Feller who, at who are at University of Virginia, go who's. Um, and I wanna start with kind of a classical picture that hopefully everyone here will be familiar with. But uh, as Robbie said, feel free to jump in um, by unmuting yourself and asking me. I'm not gonna look at the chat, uh, but if people see good chat questions, they can interrupt me and read those out loud as well. So I, I'm going to distinguish between three different kinds of zeta functions that as number theorists or algebraic geometers, we might be familiar with. Uh, and the first one in the left column is the Riemann zeta function. We all know this pretty well, um, at least through, through folklore and the amount that it gets mentioned. Um, but I want to kind of give, you know, highlight some different aspects of it that you might not have thought about before. Uh, in the middle column is the Dedekind zeta function. That's really just kind of a, a cheap generalization of the Riemann zeta function to number fields. Uh, of course, there's a lot of depth and beauty there too, but um, for the purposes of my talk, there, there, there's not too much distance between the two. And then seemingly in a different direction, although these are all tied up and related, is uh, the Hasse Zeta zeta function. So if we take a finite field FQ, and we look at a variety, maybe I should say, you know, smooth, quasi-projective, some, some other adjectives, um, but just varieties in general over a finite field, um, we can look at a certain generating function for the uh, point counting function of that variety over extensions of the finite field. So, uh, so you know, I'll give each of these names, they're, they're, they're sort of 
famous formulas are, are listed here in the first line of the table. Um, and the way I think about the first two is really as generating functions for, for the Riemann zeta function for, for integers raised to, to complex powers. Um, for Dedekind zeta functions, the sum here is over uh, integral ideals of the ring of integers, OK. Um, and then we take norms of those ideals, and we have, we're generating essentially the, the, the possible norms of all ideals in that number field. Um, and then for the Hasse Weyz zeta function, uh, the, the way this is typically first introduced is with the, the following exponential formula. So again, I said this is a generating function or a generating series for point counts of x over uh, finite extensions of fq. So for the, the uh, finite field with q to the n elements, we'll take the point counts over that field divided by n, and that's the coefficient in front of uh, our variable t raised to the n. So again, just you know, there's some reason we take the exponential. Don't worry so much about it. The, the takeaway here is that it's a generating function. It's capturing the information of the point counts of that variety. Um, what's interesting and where these, these different looking formulas start to resemble each other more is in the, their, their product formulas. So uh, possibly due to Euler, although I don't, I don't always know what he knew how to prove and what he just knew without proof. Um, but the product formula for the Riemann zeta function is kind of the, the, the main first indication that there's some deeper number theory going on with this a priori just complex analytic function. Um, so the product form formula expresses the Riemann zeta function as a product of factors, one for each prime number p. And each factor is uh, 1 minus 1 over p to the s. And you invert the whole thing. And there, there's, a, there's a, a lot more to the story of where these, these individual local factors come from. Likewise, for the Dedekind zeta function, um, and, and by the way, the, where this comes from, of course, is the unique factorization in, uh, in the ring of integers, and then for Dedekind zeta function and the, the, uh, the ideal, the, the semi-ring of ideals of the uh, ring of integers for that number field, the same sort of statement applies. So we'll have some sort of product formula for the Dedekind zeta function. There's uh, actually a nice product formula for the Hasse Weyz zeta function that I've listed over here on the right which takes the form of a product over all closed points of the variety. And the factors here, so the factor of a closed point is uh, 1 minus t raised to the degree of x, where the degree here I just mean to be the uh, degree of the, the field of definition for, uh, for that, that closed point. And then we'll invert that whole thing. So they start to resemble each other a little bit more when, when you write out these product formulas this way. And it turns out if you uh, do a little bit of work you can take this product formula for the Hasse Weyz zeta function and write down what I'll, I'll call the cycle formula, or just more of more of a generating function-looking formula for the Hasse Weyz zeta function. And the reason that I wrote that redundant one there, um, actually, this one is because somehow, just like in my Riemann and Dedekind, Dedekind formulas, I have a a one coefficient when I'm generating each of the fractions here. So one over n to the s, one over norm raised to the s. Um, I also have a one times the variable with some powers here. And we're gonna see that recur throughout the talk. So I just wanted to highlight there, that there. So I, I'm gonna tell you this story in a little bit different way than you're used to now. The ideas through the, the first chunk of the talk actually go back to the 70s to Stanley um, Rota and some other combinatorialists. Um, but I'm, I really wanna just talk about the, the number theory implications here. So we can think of these generating functions as summing over, just at a really basic level, as summing over a post set. And in the Riemann case, we're summing over the natural numbers. Actually, infinity. Yep. Andrew, I've got a question. That I, I realize you made a side come about combinatorialists. And uh, were they, so they were thinking, can you say that again? Uh, that they were, I, I know you don't want to talk about it now, but. I'll, I'll actually really come back to it. So okay. I'm going to talk just about post sets in a moment. And then that's a good time for that question. But yeah, uh, well, uh, I mean, the, like the, the examples, some of the examples they had were at least the left column, the Riemann zeta function. I, I couldn't find any the Dedekind or Hasse Bay stuff written down, so I'm, I'm, uh, I have a, an expository thing ready to go with that just for my own sanity. But, um, you know, it's, it's all pretty much working with post sets. And the underlying post set then for, you know, the Dedekind zeta function is, again, that, that semi-ring of I ideals in the ring of integers with uh, containment, reverse containment or division, whatever you want to call this, this, um, this partial ordering. And then for the Hasse Weyz zeta function, um, 
you know, if you haven't seen this before, we can talk about it a bit, but uh, if you look at the, the um, post set of effective zero cycles on your variety, ordered by the, the less than or equal to, you know, the, the ordering relation on, on coefficients, um, this gives you a post set structure. And we're summing over, in this cycle formula, we're summing over effective zero cycles, where the degree of an effective zero cycle is, is you know, what you think it is. You, you add up the coefficients and the degrees of the points. So we can broaden our perspective a little bit here. Let's, let's think about uh, adding, you know, generating something over, uh, by adding up over one of these three post sets, um, the types of things you might generate or you might turn into a generating series are what I'm just gonna call arithmetic functions. Um, and so arithmetic functions typically mean some complex valued function on the uh, natural numbers. Uh, but in each of these contexts, I want to think of some complex valued function on that post set that I started with. And then I can build from each of those functions f a Dirichlet series or, or some type of generating series, which uh, in the classical case are called Dirichlet series. So um, instead of just a one in the numerator, no, notice that I'm putting in the values of that function at each natural number, at each integral ideal a, and then uh, at each effective zero cycle. I'm going to let those be the coefficients of my generating series. What can I do with that? Well, you might ask, um, if I take two of these Dirichlet series and multiply them, I get a new Dirichlet series. And let's call the, the numerator, the coefficients here for the, the F series times the G series, just H of N. Now that's some arithmetic function by definition. And you could ask, you know, what is that function? And uh, I haven't, so my, my, I'm just gonna kind of give away a little bit of the slide here, sorry. Um, let's do this in purple, why not? So there's a classical recursive formula for this, um, for this what, what's called the convolution product of the functions f and g. So if I take f and g and multiply them and I add up all the ways of multiplying their values over the ways uh, to partition n, then this actually gives, I mean, th this is a lemma, but you can prove that this gives the coefficients hn in that formula. Uh, and you can actually do something similar, which we might as, might as well just call Dirichlet convolution for, um, for ideals in a number field and then for effective zero cycles. So the formula is exactly the same. You can prove this as a lemma if you want. Not happy with my sigma there. Um, and here we're gonna look at all the ways. So I used a, let's use b. Um, sorry, this is dividing still. Say B, C, multiply to give you the, the ideal A, and we'll look at F of B and G of C. And then finally, for the uh, Haas of A zeta function, we're adding up zero cycles. We'll look at all possible ways to add up maybe beta and gamma. Um, which are also effective zero cycles. So there's going to be a finite number of ways to do all of these things. And we'll look at F of beta G of gamma. Okay, so you know, I haven't really said anything interesting, but we're, we're sort of packaging things in a different way and it's going to get interesting in a moment. Um, one specific function, our arithmetic function we can plug in each of these cases is just a function that sends everything in our post set to one. And classically uh, in that, you know, going back to the 70s with Stanley and Rota and these other combinatorialists, they call these just the, the post set zeta function. I'm going I'm to write these in green for the rest of the talk. The post set zeta function takes everything to one. And it just so happens that if you plug that into the places where I've plugged in arithmetic functions here, here, and here, you're going to get the Riemann, Dedekind, and Hasebe zeta functions, of course. We, we, we sort of set ourselves up for that. Um, what's interesting is we could ask, well, you know, is there a convolution inverse? Is this a ring structure? Sure enough, it is. And is there a convolution inverse to that abstract green zeta function? Is there something that convolves and gives you the identity? Um, or in other words, is there a, a, a power series inverse to each of these types of zeta functions? And sure enough, there is. There's an arithmetic function called the Mobius function, which has a nice recursive formula as well. You can work all this out by hand, just guessing you know, from the definition of the Mobius function as like the convolution inverse, you can work out, uh, one sec. 
you can work out what this has to be. And because uh, sometimes I'm a little discalculate, um, I want to remind myself of this formula so I don't mess it up early. So it's zero anytime you have a square prime factor. And it's negative, it's uh, ones or negative ones, depending on how many distinct prime factors you have. So if I write, if I write n, oops, one sec. If I write n as the product of r distinct primes and I don't have any square factors, uh, then I'll, I'll let that be negative one to the r. There's a similar formula for all of these, which, you know, um, it's basically what you expect. If I write my ideal A as now a unique product of distinct prime ideals, R of them, then I'll, I'll send that, uh, that ideal to negative one of the R. And if I have any square prime ideals in my uh, Dedekind domain factorization, then I'll, I'll just wipe that out. And there's something similar here, you know, just it's not illuminating to write it out, um, but I, I'm happy to do that if, if anyone's curious. Uh, so we've got a Mobius function. The claim is that these are, these are convolution inverses. And what this means is that they can evolve to give you the, now, you know, not the function sending everything to one, but the identity function in the, the ring of arithmetic functions under convolution. What this really means is that their, their power series, their generating functions, multiply to give you the identity generating function. Or said another way, there's uh, the, the Riemann zeta function has an inverse series that's given by add up all of the, uh, or ge generate using the Mobius function. The, uh, you know, this is a classical formula that, that kind of gets the Mobius function into the picture when it comes to, to primes and the Riemann hypothesis. Um, but I, I haven't seen much stated for the Dedekind and Hasse Bayes zeta versions of this. Um, so the, the Mobius function that we defined in blue sure enough, generates an inverse series for the Dedekind zeta function. And then um, if we use that, the thing that I didn't write the formula for, we can actually generate an inverse positive A series, which maybe we'll call the Mobius series for, for that variety X. Uh, so, you know, all of this is well and good. This is sort of a classical story. Uh, and we can generalize this quite a bit, uh, going back to the language of, of actually, Stanley. Yeah, yeah go ahead. There's, there's a, uh, Jordan has a question. Oh yeah, although maybe maybe you're about to answer it. I just, I mean, this, the mo somehow I'm a little confused about whether I should be thinking of a naked post set or whether somehow this notion of convolution you have seems to require us to be able to multiply elements of a post set, which in a plain old unadorned post set I can't do, right? <clears throat> um, right. So I can't. Yeah, this is a great question, uh, which I, I actually haven't thought about explaining the next part this way. So I like the question a lot. Uh, we can't just multiply things in post sets. What we can do is take functions on post sets and multiply and convolve those functions. And that's basically always possible. All you need, all you need is the structure of a post set to do that. I see. Um, no, I feel kind of naive, but I feel like if you can scroll up, like in your definition of the convolution, it looks like you're talking about I mean, using the fact that you can multiply integers or multiply ideal, like in your definition of. So, so the, the, the definition of convolution is I can multiply either the series or I can, the purple formulas are multiplying the outputs of functions and then partitioning ways of, of, uh, of the input value. I'm, I'm able to partition and that's actually the next definition is an interval in a post set. So I think that kind of okay. transitions us to the, the, yeah, just a naked post set. What, can, what structure can we possibly look at that will allow us to convolve? And I think you'll see the answer to this in a moment. But yeah, great question. Um, awesome, thank you. Basically, the punchline is we shouldn't be able to do anything, but what can we do with the post set? So let's start by looking at ways of partitioning our sum ends, or really partitioning our input values from our post set. And that's going to bring us to the notion of an interval. So um, uh, if, we, if we have a post set P, uh, then an interval in that post set is just a, a sub post set of the form, all the things between X and Y. And I'll call a post set locally finite if all of these intervals are finite sets. So uh, in order to study convolution, the, the, the magic words usually in the literature are incidence algebra or incidence co-algebra. So the incidence, co and, and for, for reasons that I, I probably won't get into in this talk, it's a lot easier for later abstractions using homotopy theory to start with the co-algebra. And then if you can, dualize later. Um, so the incidence co-algebra of one of these post sets is 
uh, first of all, as a vector space, it's free on those, those sets of intervals, or the, the set of all the intervals in the post set. And the co-multiplication for this co-algebra is given by sending an interval to the tensor product uh, of all the ways of partitioning that interval into subintervals x to z, z to y. So I need this locally finite condition for these to be finite sums. Um, but theoretically, you could treat these as just abstract uh, gadgets of, of, of some flavor. Everything we're dealing with is locally finite, by the way. So then this, you know, the next step is how we get convolution involved. We, uh, when we have you know, our, our k vector spaces with this co-multiplication, there's a classical way to dualize and get, uh, get an incidence algebra, or sometimes called a convolution al algebra. So if we take the dual vector space, there's a multiplication structure given by sending, uh, and I'll just do it on elementary tensors. If we have phi and psi, which are functions on the free vector space of intervals, then we can take their convolution product phi star psi here, and its value on an interval x, y is going to be uh, all ways of splitting up, of partitioning that interval um, from x to z and z to y. And then we'll take the first function's values on the first interval and the second function's values on the second interval. This is kind of just an abstract, just using the structure, excuse me, the structure of a locally finite post set uh, way to get some notion of convolution. Now, this doesn't quite bear uh, exact resemblance to what we saw above, um, but I'll say a word about that in a moment. So in any uh, incidence algebra for a post set, uh, and these, these are these distinguished elements going back to Stanley, Rota, and some of the other um, older authors, uh, there are two distinguished elements in every incidence algebra for a post set. The zeta function in green, sending every interval to one, and then uh, there is, again, a recursive formula for its convolution inverse, which we'll call the Mobius function in blue again. Um, Andrew, can you... Um yeah, we have a request. Can you go back and just show us the definitions again? So yep, we'll absolutely. adjust them. I think these are the definitions people probably want. Um, yeah, that's right. I am happy. I'm, I'm going to send all this out after. I'll you know send it to Ravi and I'll post it on my website if people want to look back. Um, Great. I'll post the slides then on ours too. Great. And, and, um, so, and these this algebra and co-algebra. This is like a half algebra structure, like the, the uh, sometimes, yeah. That's actually so. Uh, I'm not going to talk about when things are half algebras. I think for post sets they always are. Um, but what's more interesting is when we start souping this up to uh, simplicial spaces. When you get a half algebra structure, and you know, there, uh, I, I'm just going to punt to uh, Joachim Cox's short survey called "Half Algebras of Intervals" or "Interval Half Algebra," something like that. If you Google Cox and uh, Hopf algebra interval, you'll, you'll see it. And he actually says some words about the Hopf algebra structure. Yeah, so that, that's exactly the idea uh, that we're working with here. Andrew, can I ask something? Sure. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about, um, eh, not without too many spoilers, why you're doing all this? I'm, I'm afraid that I lose track of definitions, but maybe having some motivation will help me. Yeah, let's, let's, let's at least recover the, the examples that we know about. So this, that's the point of this next example. Um, and then, after that, check back with me if, if you still want to know. Um, I think I'm, I'm trying to build towards it at the end of the talk, why we're kind of digging up this old stuff. Again, it's, you know, like at least 40 years old. Um, but there are some new ideas that are not, like, that have been around for at least like three, four, five years that, that make this stuff really exciting for number theorists like me. Uh, yes, John, I just saw John. I'm not watching the chat, but I, I got a preview of uh, incidence algebras. That might be... Uh, slides for a talk or something, but if you look on archive, Joachim Koch has has a, a talk about this as, or has um has a short paper about it as well. So and, let's, actually, there's another interesting question from Dmitry Zakharov. Uh, the uh, the the Hara zeta function of a graph is defined directly as an Euler product. It does not have a definition as a sum. Does this mean it, that it doesn't fit into the poset framework? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but you don't always need to have a generating function around. In, in like the sum formula in order to still treat it like the, uh, you know, some sort of generating function for, for a post set, or, or rather some sort of zeta function for a post set. I, I'm familiar with that example. I just don't know if it fits into this framework. My guess is uh, probably you can say something about it. And actually, uh, I, I don't have it on these slides, but we, we can talk about it more at the end if people are curious. Um, all of the product formulas for these functions, you can actually get directly from the post set structure of uh, natural numbers, the semi-ring of um, integral ideals, and then the, the 
effective zero cycles. So the like Euler product formula for those three, somehow just, you know, if you don't care about convergence in a complex plane, all of those formulas come straight from them. Um, decomposing the post sets into sub post sets. And I think something like that should be possible for the Ahara Zeta function as well. But I, you know, that, that's a good question for another time. So let's- Can I, can I say, uh, can I'm I ask sure. from a different perspective since you're working with Julia Bruckner. So you're kind of a defining some sort of a whole algebra for the post sets. Yeah, actually- Does that make uh, any sense? Yeah, um, yeah, these are Hall algebras by another name. And uh, okay. I, I want to, Maybe I'll say something about that at the end. I, I don't think I'll have time, but uh, if, if you want to get excited about some of the implications at the end, uh, mm -hmm. then I would recommend Dickerhoff and Kapranov's paper. Motiv um, I, I'm blanking on the name. I, I can send it out, but it, it has motivic Hall algebras as one of the sections in, in chapter mm -hmm. eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this stuff is like very compatible with this framework in a way that I, uh, I'm hoping to build to. Um, th these are great questions, but I'm going to try to keep things moving because I think some of the talk is going to answer these as well. So um, the Riemann, Dedekind, Hasse, Zeta functions we started with, all of their Mobius inversion principles that I stated as formulas in blue, these are all special cases. Uh, the subtlety here is that I, I'm dealing with intervals in the post set setup but all I really need to do to recover any of those cases is start with that post set I advertised at the start in the big chart, and then pass to what's called the reduced incidence algebra. In the case of Riemann, um, it loosely corresponds to passing from intervals mn to intervals one to n divided by m. Um, remember that this is a division post set, so these are actually isomorphic as, as uh, sub post sets or as, as interval, interval sets inside of the post set. And if you do that and you kind of muck around with the algebra structure, you'll get exactly the same Mobius inversion principles. You'll recover those objects. Uh, so really all that I've stated that's like not just a definition or a philosophy about this is that Mobius inversion principle. And if we take that seriously as sort of a, a, a formula that tells you new things about arithmetic functions and their generating functions, uh, you can deduce these product formulas. You can deduce a lot more about um, just what arithmetic functions are saying in each circumstance and uh, and I you know there's a lot more to say about this that I hopefully people will get interested in by the end but I, I want to make a pivot now to talk about the homotopy theory side of things because this is where things are, are getting exciting these days so uh, the notion of decomposition spaces uh, is you know the term is coined by uh, Galvez Carrillo, Koch, and Tonks and these three authors have a series of really great uh, papers kind of laying out just the theory of decomposition spaces with an angle towards abstract Mobius inversion. Um, so the idea is that these convolution products, the incidence algebras we defined above, they don't just come from post set structures, but they come from something much more abstract, uh, which you know I've called higher homotopy theoretic structure, but I, I couldn't think of a better phrase for that. But there's some homotopy theory that's really governing all of this uh, and not in a superficial way. So um, I, this is an algebraic geometry seminar, so I, I just wanted to recall a couple of things from, from homotopy theory, just in case you're not familiar with this. Um, a simplicial set is just a functor from this delta category of combinatorial simplices. It's a, a contravariant functor from delta to set. So the way you should think about simplicial sets is it's uh, an assignment of a set x0, x1, x2 for each uh, natural number and zero, together with a bunch of uh, face and degeneracy maps between these. You, sh you should think about these things like, um, you know, the basic example is if we have a point in interval, you know, are just basic combinatorial simplices. Um, a triangle a tetrahedron and so forth. And the maps in between, the, the set maps here are ways of including one into the other degenerately or picking off sides or faces of each of these, these sets. Um, that's kind of the basic idea, but you know, abstractly it's a gadget for capturing some combinatorial or simplicial information about, about a structure. Okay, well, let's start with simplicial sets. It turns out you can make an abstract definition of incidence co-algebra for this type of object. Uh, and then we'll make a connection here. Um, so if I start with the suitably finite, whatever, you know, whatever hypotheses make this have finite sums, uh, simplicial set X, 
um, then the incidence coalgebra I will take to be the free vector space on one simplices, which I'll denote little x. And the co-multiplication map here is going to send um, send the vector determined by that x uh, to the sum. So the sum here is a little difficult to parse, um, but there's a picture for it. So the sum over all two simplices sigma, whose one face is x, and we sum all over all those things, and the, the sum ends are the two face and the zero face tensor together. So this gives you a co-multiplication structure. And the picture here is that here's a two simplex. If my one face here is x, that's going to show up in the sum with a positive coefficient. And I'm going to sum up uh, sum over all the ways to do this, the tensor of the two other legs of the triangle. So this is like purely simplicial at this point. And it turns out that in order for this to be, you know, a nice co-algebra, let's say co-associative, co-unital, um, and have all the properties that we would expect from the, the post set examples, then this is more or less the same thing as having what's called the decomposition, spec, a decomposition set, uh, which also goes by the name two Siegel set. And two Siegel might be a little more familiar in the literature. So I'm not gonna spell out exactly what the, the conditions, what the, the axioms are for either of these, these uh, blue things here, but the point is they're, they're simplicial sets that have enough structure to give a co-associative, co-unital multiplication operation, a co-multiplication operation on this thing here. So is the, you, yeah. so is the to, get, to go from, if you have a post set, the corresponding simplicial set, are you, I don't know, mapping simplices into the post set in, that, in a way that like all the faces get, get squished to things that are, I mean, do they map to chain? Like, yeah, what exactly? How yeah, do yeah. You, yeah, so how, how do post sets uh, interact with this? Um, th this subsumes post sets completely because every post set is a category sort of in, in the, the obvious way. Morphisms are the, arrows in the po or the inclusions in the post set and um, uh, every category is a simplicial set by the nerve functor so that if you just sort of include things in the canonical way that way then post sets have incidence co-algebras defined this way and you can show without too much work um, that that's exactly the same as the incidence co-algebra defined at the post set level above so intervals and and again you want to say locally finite so these sums are well defined but Intervals and ways of partitioning um, sim two simplices are analogous, and, and they give you isomorphic uh, algebra stru or co-algebra structures. You can dual dualize all this and do a convolution product again, but I I'm just going to sort of the, you know the rocket ship is taking off a bit here, and I want to focus on the the bare bones co-algebra structure because that's what we can mimic at every step of the way. So um, the authors of these papers, Galvez, Carrillo, Koch, and Tonks. And then independently, Dickerhoff and Kapranov um, generalize this considerably to, to simplicial spaces. So um, the first authors call these decomposition spaces, and that's the part of the title of my talk. Um, Dickerhoff and Kapranov, with very different motivations in mind, uh, including the motivic Hall algebra uh, that, that was mentioned in, in a question, um, call these two Siegel spaces. And two Siegel spaces show up everywhere nowadays in homotopy theory. They are part of the uh, you know, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but they're involved in modeling infinity categories in a specific way. And if you want to see more about that, if those buzzwords actually mean something to you, then uh, go take a look at some of the papers of Julie Bergner uh, to see how those fit in just to homotopy theory proper. Um, actually, can you see what two Siegel sets are? Maybe you... Uh, yeah. Uh, did I leave space? No, I didn't leave. I left some spaces on these slides so I could add things, but not here, I guess. Um, so a... A two Siegel, it's easier to say what a two Siegel set is, and then a two Siegel space is, you know, some space version of this, which I'll, I'll say a little bit, a little bit about below. So a, a one Siegel set is uh, basically um, a simplicial set where you can make sense of composition of morphisms, and the morphisms are uniquely defined. And uh, the nerve of a category is is an example of a one Siegel set, and in fact, the nerve of a category is is the same thing as a, as a one Siegel set. So um, if you relax that assumption a little bit and allow, uh, you know, that morphism is kind of a nebulous concept for simplicial sets. Um, but if you, if you have morphisms and they're only sometimes defined and they're not uniquely defined, even if they are defined, so you can have basically uh, partially or multi-valued uh, compositions in your simplicial set, then that's the notion of a two Siegel set. 
And that's kind of the easiest way to say it without, I, I could give, you know, multiple lectures just on that. Um, and I, I think at this point, I encourage you to go read some of uh, Julie Bergner's and her co-authors work uh, to really get an idea how, how two Siegel sets or, and two Siegel spaces, more importantly, um, should be treated or should be considered. For me, they are the natural place to get a, an incidence co-algebra structure. Um, and they also happen to be the natural place to get a Hall algebra structure when you think of them as two Siegel spaces. Yeah. So in order to take our incidence co-algebra ideas from, from decomposition sets and two Siegel sets all the way up to the level of spaces, and what I mean by that is replacing the category of set with some category of spaces, maybe infinity groupoids if you like, um, but any of these models of topological spaces, uh, we want to really relax our notion of vector space and then ultimately algebra and co-algebra in order to make this possible. So I'm going to do a little bit of a riff on what's something that's called homotopy linear algebra. This is a pretty deep rabbit hole, um, but I'm happy to recommend a couple places to read more about this if you're interested. So uh, before we kind of dive into the next chart, uh, the, the idea, the, the real target that we want here is to take our, uh, our setup, um, our, our simplicial set setup where we were allowed to define incidence co-algebras and then ask if they are co-associative, co-unital, if they have a Mobius inversion principle, um, and then promote that to simplicial spaces. So uh, rather than, so in gray, I have my simplicial sets X, I'm going to replace those with simplicial spaces. Um, so again, the target here is spaces. Um, and the, the first sort of pill to swallow here to make sense of this is, we should think about vector spaces. We, we should kind of forget about vector spaces and just, you know, let's be linear algebra one students. And we, we think that all vector spaces are the same as bases. Now it's not strictly, uh, it's not a good idea in general, but we, we should think about maybe a vector space with a choice of bases as kind of like the easier thing to work with here. So the underlying object then, if we pivot our, our perspective then is that you have a, a basis, which is a set of vectors, so let's just forget about the vector space and talk about the set of vectors. There's a way in which um, all of linear algebra, or, or a lot of like basic linear algebra, matri matrix and vector multiplication, scalar multiplication, even some of the products in, in, um, in linear algebra can be phrased just in terms of those sets that are, you know, they're really acting as the bases. Um, but you can do a lot of that just using the, the, the basis elements. Um, and it turns out that the right way to think about this in abstraction is as uh, the, the vectors we're working with are objects in the slice category over a particular basis set or, or for in blue it'll be a basis space um, and then ways of building spans of objects in that slice category will give you things like matrices or, or linear transformations as, as represented by a matrix. Um, so these are all sort of vector space independent but basis based uh, ways of doing linear algebra. If we want to make sense of uh, now, you know, the free vector space on one simplices for sets now is, is, is pretty easy. We should think of that slice category um, as the free vector, vector space on that, that object we're slicing by. So for us, if we fix a particular simplicial space X, we look at the slice category over now the space X1, uh, the one simplices of that simplicial space, then the slice category here is kind of playing the role of our free vector space on one simplices. Uh, and th the point of doing this, at least from my perspective and from these authors' perspectives, the point of this whole formality of homotopy linear algebra is we can replace this co-multiplication map where we, we partitioned by looking at all two simplices with uh, X as one of its faces, and we looked at, you know, we picked off the other faces of that two simplex. Um, we can really abstract away this tensor structure and the ways we're adding up here just by looking at span diagrams. So uh, there's a map from the, so again, just to remind you, this S slice X1, that's the, that's the co-algebra, and that's the free vector space on X1. Um, the tensor product of the co-algebra with itself should really be thought of as the slice category of X1 cross itself. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this gives you a tensor structure on the, uh, the category of slice categories um, with a particular base category S. And the, the right way to think about this partition and co-multiplication sum formula is as 
uh, as the following span. And the way to read this is starting on the left with x1, we pull back along d1. That's like asking what, what two simplices have, uh, have d1 equals x, and then pushing forward along the pair d2, d0, which takes us into the product x1 cross x1. So this whole chart, and this is, that's almost the end. Um, but this whole chart is really, you know, it's hard to kind of swallow the first time you think about it, but I just want to kind of give you some of the, the, the pieces of this dictionary, and then hopefully you'll be motivated enough um, by what we'll, we're about to do with it to go and learn the rest of the dictionary, or even to work out some of it yourself. Once you get these things in mind, you can ask about how do you define tensor products? You know, I, I alluded to what the answer is. Um, how do you take the dual of a vector space? That's actually not too hard. Um, I, I think I'm gonna say that in a moment. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you even write down like matrix vector multiplication? How do you do other types of things you learn about in linear algebra? As far as I've found, you can basically do all of these in the objective setting or the, the homotopy objective setting. Uh, and it's some formal gadget that at the end of the day, we can recover our original vector spaces just by taking cardinalities of sets or homotopy cardinalities of spaces. Um, so we're, we're, we're really not leaving the, the ground too much here. Uh, so the nice thing and the point of this talk is zeta functions and decomposition spaces. If I have a, a simplicial space that, uh, that happens to be a decomposition space, so all of these things are, are well-defined, this co-multiplication is homotopy co-associative, homotopy co-unital, um, all these other nice, nice things, maybe even a homotopy Hopf algebra, um, then it has a distinguished, uh, it has a distinguished um, element here, which is the zeta functor, uh, they call it in these papers. Um, but as an element of the incidence algebra, so the dual of this incidence co-algebra S slice X1, um, it sends, it sends uh, any object, so actually, let me, let me just tell you what the span is. Uh, the span is given by uh, the identity along the left leg and then the terminal map along the right leg. And the way to read this is that we take any one simplex, um, <clears throat> any one simplex in X1, we pull it back along the identity and we push it forward to the same thing. So this is exactly the same thing as or I mean, it's 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 a generalization, but when you when you take homotopy cardinality, it's exactly the same thing as when we sent every interval or every one simplex to just the element one in our ground field. Um, so there's a, a notion of zeta functor, and it 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 uh, captures the the previous notions that that we had. So again, okay, yeah, I wrote a, a reminder here if you want to recover all of the classical notions and let you know we we know how to go from post sets to decomposition sets. Um, so if you want to recover all of the decomposition set stuff, and then from there, specific examples include the Riemann and Dedekind and Hasse zeta function, then you just take so, cardinality so, uh, or homotopy so cardinality. So I've forgotten what a decomposition set was. That was the same thing as a, that was the same thing as a, uh, as a two seagulls. Uh, was, was that, let's see. It's a two seagull <laughs> set. Great, two seagull set, got it. Yes, right. um, and, I, and I didn't even give you the definition. I, I sort of cheated and said, uh, again, it's, it's the type of structure that makes this co-multiplication nice. Absolutely. Um, and that's, so, yeah. so when you say, so, okay, great. So you apply this to a post set and you get something which you could interpret as a zeta function, but now you could apply this to any kind of top log, any kind of simplicial, you, you just replace the post set by absolutely any simplicial um, object at all and you get some analog of a zeta function. Is that what you're saying? Uh, potential, yeah. So actually, sure. You can, you can make this definition without saying decomposition space. You could just have an abstract simplicial space replacing your post set and you'll have a, an element of that slice category or rather a functor on that slice category. Like this green definition here, this span diagram that determines uh, the zeta functor, that has nothing to do with the decomposition space axioms. In order for the, you know, sorry, for barking. Um, in order for if you want to study the zeta function in isolation, then here you go. But if you want to convolve it with other functions and really get some properties, you know, prove like a product formula for it or something, whatever that means in this setting, I, you know, I don't even know yet. Um, you want, uh, you know, you want a co-multiplication structure given by this, this blue span here that's, co that's homotopy co-associative, homotopy co-unital, all those other nice things. And that will allow you to prove formulas. And the, the sort of... Um, the proof of concept that Galvez, Carrillo, Cock, and Tonks 
show is that Mobius inversion holds in this general setting if your simplicial space is a decomposition space. So I, I think that was a bit of a word salad, um, but hopefully, you know, hold me to it if, if that didn't make sense. Well, what is the meaning, right, so I, I, I don't mean this literally, but what is the meaning of the statement that Mobius inversion works? Like that's a statement about what is... Yeah, it's, it's hard. So, um, yeah, um, there's a formula at the level of, so this is our zeta functor. There's not, a, there's not a Mobius functor on the nose that like gives you a, conv a convolution inverse in the, uh, in, the, in the objective setting here. Uh, but what you can do, you know, this is... This is good, keep going, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to debate, no, it, it takes a little bit to say it, but there, abstract Mobius inversion for, um, for categories, which are certainly generalizations of post sets in a certain direction, looks like the following. So our, our Mobius function, if you remember, it looked like, you know, zero if you have squares and negative one to the R if you have distinct powers. Um, there's a way to write this as um, a, an even piece minus an odd piece where these are just two other appropriately defined arithmetic functions. And each of these, can be defined at the level of categories. Certainly, the way to think about, I mean, you, you can define these for yourself actually without me telling you, uh, or, or without having to go look it up in the research, in, in the literature. Uh, the even and odd pieces are going to pick out when, um, or if and when a, uh, if and when a morphism in a category has a, decom a decomposition into an even or an odd number of, of other morphisms. So remember that our, our uh, simplicial set and simplicial space uh, sort of formalism here for, for doing convolution, algebra, convolution um, incidence algebras and co-algebras is decomposing, uh, decomposing morphisms or decomposing one simplices in different ways. So the different ways of decomposing into either an even or an odd number of morphisms gets substantially generalized by this, uh, I think really the third paper in the Galvez Carrillo Cock and Tonks sequence. Um, and they show that you can abstract this even and odd idea directly to decomposition spaces. Uh, you really need the decomposition space axioms in order to make sense of these. And then they show that, so that the classical Mobius inversion is this, right? So another way to say that is that um, even, Convolved. Oops. Come on now. Even convolved with zeta equals one plus odd convolved with zeta, right? And this is a formula that is the like explicitly. This formula is the homotopy cardinality applied to a certain formula of zeta even and odd functors at the homotopy linear algebra level for, for any decomposition space. This is, what they, this is what's proven in, in that, that sequence of papers. So, you know, if I, I, I can cheat a little bit. I'll tell you what the formula is. It's, uh, there are functor, oops, I messed up my joke. There are functors and you replace an equal sign with a sim ek, uh, which is supposed to mean homotopy equivalent or weak, or, uh, weak equivalent in the simplicial space sense. And, taking a homotopy cardinality recovers the, the, the categorical version. So I, I think that's what I am comfortable saying right now. Um, and really the, the point, um, and I, I wanna double check, this is, this is a one hour, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, so I, I, there, there's a lot more to even just this story that I've told you so far, but there's so much more information just when we bring homotopy theory into the picture. Um, if anyone's thought anything about motivic homotopy theory, which I, I happen to be a, a big fan of, um, anytime you start bringing that language or that framework into the picture to solve your particular problem, usually you realize there's a whole lot more you can say about the problem just by having infinity categories or having, you know, being able to take um, uh, any pi and any, any um, homotopy groups of your, your objects gives you a ton of extra stuff that you, you don't normally expect just looking at the, the pi zero level. So I'm gonna kind of 
tell you a bit about, again, this is very preliminary uh, in, in progress, but we have some concrete things written down that we, we hope to prove um, in the direction of a decomposition space description of Kapranov's motivic zeta functions. So this, is, this is quite a pivot for, from what we've been doing, but I hope to tie it all back together in the end. So um, one zeta function that was conspicuously not on my list because it doesn't fit into the post-set framework is the motivic zeta function. So just to recall, um, if I have a, a k variety and now k is any field you like, uh, and I should really say, uh, for this formula, I should say quasi-projective, um, then uh, we can write down a generating series with coefficients in the Grotendi group of, of uh, k varieties, k0 var, var k, um, where the coefficients of t to the n are the n symmetric power of x. And just to remind you, I think I was using green, sim n x is, you take the nth power of the variety and then quotient out by the uh, nth symmetric group action just on the factors there. <laughs> So uh, the bracket notation is just the, the class represented by that variety in the Grotendieck group. And um, I will say what the Grotendieck group is if, if someone asks about it. Um, some of this stuff I just kind of threw on there to just have definitions down. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to say more about the motivic zeta function if you're not as familiar with that. Um, but the key fact, you know, if all you want to know about the motivic zeta function is like why we care about it, in relation to other zeta functions then a lot of the zeta functions that we've previously written down and, and a lot more than just these that I've talked about in this talk can be recovered by applying a specific motivic measure to the the Kapranov motivic zeta function. So the one that I'm uh, mostly interested in for this talk is if I have a, a variety over a finite field and I apply the point counting measure uh, which is really it's a, a ring map on this Grotendieck ring of, of k varieties um, if I apply that to like coefficient wise this motivic zeta function, I will recover the Hasse Bay zeta function for that variety x. And this takes a little bit of wrangling the formula for the motivic zeta function or, or for the Hasse Bay zeta function, um, but this is, this is well known. And some interesting things about the, uh, at least about the Hasse Bay zeta function that sort of have implications for the motivic zeta function in this setting. Uh, for one, you can you can use the ideas and, you know, not just the statements of the vague conjectures, but use the ideas of the proofs of the vague conjectures to really promote the Hasse zeta function of a variety uh, up to a motivic measure. So again, it's a ring map on K0. Uh, in this case, it'll take values in power series over the l adic integers, and we'll send um, a quasi-projective variety uh, in the Grotendieck group, or the Grotendieck ring, to this product of these uh, local factors, these, these determinants um, <clears throat> that are given by the, the grodeck lefschetz philosophy in, in the vague conjectures. So um, the fact that this promotes your motivic measure isn't so hard. You need to know a little bit about how these, how these factors work on the right side. Um, but some of this is discussed in the uh, paper that I'm about to mention, which is work of Jonathan Campbell, Anna Zakarevich, and I actually should add Jesse Wilson to this list as well. Um, so in some of the, I mean, the, this is what got me reading basically all the papers of these authors. I think they have some really good ideas here. Um, the, the Campbell Zakarevich papers, and then they're, they're joined by, by Jesse Wolfson um, for this uh, zeta function application. So what they do in, in, um, in the most recent paper is construct a lift of this motivic measure given by the Hasse Bay zeta function to the level of K theory spectra. They call this the derived l adic zeta function. That's the name of the paper, by the way, if you're, if you're looking this up later. Um, but the point is that there's a lift to homotopy theory um, where we can get back down to the level of the Hasse Bay zeta function by taking pi zero of this green functor here. So there's some zeta functor, their derived l adic zeta function that, um, that captures a lot more than just the, the Hasse Bay zeta function at the pi zero level. You get all of that nice, rich point counting information about the variety. But this thing also at different pi n levels knows a lot about uh, not just the point counts themselves, but how the point counts sit inside of the variety and so forth. Um, so what's tantalizing and what I'd like to sort of pitch as, as a future direction that, again, that, that we started working on is that 
the motivic zeta function itself is is a motivic measure in the following well i'm not going to you know i mean if you if you take a, a k variety um its class in grotendieck in the grotendieck ring and send it to the motivic zeta function this thing is uh again a um a power series over the grotendieck ring and it turns out to be a motivic measure you can check this uh there i i should actually clarify that you need to modify um, the Grodeck ring a little bit to make this actually a ring map in certain circumstances. But the big idea at the end of this Campbell, Zakharevich, and Wolfson paper is that uh, Hasseve lifts to the level of, of uh, K-theory spectra. The motivic zeta function should lift as well. But it's unclear what the target of this, uh, this you know, hypothetical motivic L or this um, derived motivic zeta function would be. And I have some ideas about this that I can talk about at the end. Actually, uh, so actually, Andrew, in the, um, yeah. so the, is it worth saying what that modification is to make, uh, yeah. measure, or, or is that, or do you want to leave that as just a twiddle? No, it's fine. Uh, if you're in characteristic P, you need to invert finite radicial maps. And the reason is the way that you show that this is a motivic measure, namely that it's, it's a, I mean, motivic measure just means ring map. The way that you show it's a ring map involves a uh, certain decomposition. Um, anytime you have, <clears throat> like what, what is the, you know, what's the defining relation in Grotendieck, in the Grotendieck ring? You have a product like this. You need to show that a product when you decompose a variety into an open and a closed sub variety is preserved on the level of motivic zeta functions. In order to do that, you need some sort of co-fit. I mean, it turns out you need to look at a decomposition. Of I'm just going to call it B, decomposition of the symmetric, the n symmetric power of x. And actually, this is kind of cool too. It's sort of it it kind of hints at why we're doing any of this uh, any of this decomposition structure at all, motivically. Um, but ways of decomposing your variety can be carried through at the level of this, the uh, symmetric products. And this formula here only holds when you invert finite reducible maps in characteristic P. That thing doesn't matter in characteristic zero. So that's a little bit about that modification. Um, I think there's some stuff about that in your paper with uh, Melanie Wood, actually. But that it's definitely referred to in there. Um, so, so big idea one, which is already in the literature, is this idea that we should be able to lift motivic zeta to K theory spectra. Big idea two, which is really what we're interested in working on is, on the other hand, we've been talking about generating series of abstract zeta functions coming from decomposition spaces. And the big idea that we think is true, and we have uh, a lot of reasons to believe it is true, is that the motivic zeta function is the generating series of an abstract zeta function coming from the following decomposition space. So. Um, because I'm out of time and I don't want to hold you over, I'm happy to talk about what this decomposition space is more in detail. But um, there's a decomposition space you can build out of the category of K varieties. It has a number of properties that have already been studied successfully, including in the work of Campbell and Zakharevich and Wolfson. Um, but it somehow should be like the, the master decomposition space for all of these different zeta functions. And the motivic zeta function is kind of the, the master zeta function for a lot of other data function. So I'll, I'll leave you with a picture of how all, all these things fit together. And there's our, our um, regions in the middle, S twiddle of RK. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your attention Thanks for the extra minute at the end. And hope everyone's doing well. Great. Thanks a lot. We can all unmute ourselves.